Welcome to the Your Next Move podcast with Kimberly Brown. Y'all, I am so excited. I have a very special guest with me today, Sherelle Dorsey, and we are going to talk about all things tech and her brand new book. Now, personal story, when I first met you, I did not know who she was. We had a mutual friend, but when she walked in the room, I was like, I need to know her. I don't know what she does, but her vibe, like I could just tell that she was really dope and she did things and I wanted to be a part of it. So, and the, we've kept in touch. The feeling is so mutual. Oh, I was you. like, this one's got her stuff together. Like I need to just be surrounded by all this greatness. Oh, I love it. So that. I'm glad, I'm glad that you kept in touch. I'm glad that we've done brunch. Cause I feel yes. like brunch is such an intimate experience. Like, yes. You don't do brunch with just anybody. No, you definitely don't. <laughs> it, it either confirms or denies your relationship. Right, cause if it's like the post brunch mortem, you have to really decide, am I willing to now go the distance with this person? Yes. Could, could we could we brunch again? Yes. And we have. <laughs> so let me tell y'all how amazing she is after we clearly had a mutual vibe. So Sherelle is the founder and CEO of The Plug, a distinctive black tech news and insights platform covering black innovators in tech, venture capital, future of work policy, and so much more. She has grown the venture-backed media startup to thousands of subscribers several hundred paid members, and raised over $500,000 in equity-free capital. Prior to the plug, you worked as the marketing manager for Uber and in sales as a contractor at Google Fiber. She founded Black Tech Interactive in 2016, an award-winning hub that has supported over 2,000 entrepreneurs and technologists of color throughout the city of Charlotte. And the company was acquired in January 2021 by City Startup Labs. And of course, she is a speaker, a presenter, and she has graced the stages and inspired inclusive ecosystem of builders and leaders at South by Southwest, Amazon, the Chamber of Commerce, Brookings Institution, and so much more. And in 2018, yes, we're gonna keep going, y'all. In 2018, <laughs> she was named one of CNET's most inspiring women. And in 2021, Adweek named her as one of the top 100 creative business leaders. Her work has been in Vice, The Washington Post, Seattle Times, the information, and so much more. And your brand spanking new author of The Upper Hand. Yes. So welcome, 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 officially. I was tired just listening to that. I'm like, my goodness, too many things. It's time for rest. <laughs> Very true, but also give you your flowers and show the Thank receipts you. of all the work you've done. So yes. I want to jump right in. Tell us about your book. Yes, yeah, so Upper Hand, The Future of Work mm -hmm. for the Rest of Us. Mm -hmm. It is part memoir, but also part conversation starter for families and communities okay. that traditionally have not been included in this conversation around the future of work. Mm -hmm. Most of these discussions are happening with policy wonks. Mm -hmm. They're happening with high tech leaders. They're happening with people who I like to say are already sort of in the bubble. Got it. Um, and they're on the boat. But there are a lot of folks who do not have the language or the tools or the insights to actually get them to understand that there is a boat that exists. Mm -hmm. And when I sat down to write this book, I thought about the story of my grandfather who left Detroit mm -hmm. in the late 1950s, hopped a bus for three days to Seattle and started a job at Boeing. And he didn't have a high school a diploma. He didn't have a college degree. Mm -hmm. He had a vocational certificate and being able to work and provide for his family mm -hmm. built him into this person who could then purchase my first computer, me and my cousin's first computer, wow. usher us into tech. So I talk about that journey, but more important, I talk about the interesting case studies and the awesome skills-based opportunities and mm -hmm. learning activities you can do with your family to start thinking about mm -hmm. a strategy for how do we ensure your place in the future of work. So it sounds like from a very young age, you knew and it was understood that tech is the future. It was integrated. It was integrated in a very, I think, thoughtful way. Uh -huh. I think a lot of times we get excited by the robots and words like artificial mm. intelligence yes. and metaverse yes. and Web3 and cryptocurrency. But at its most basic level, when we think about the interdependent nature of of technology. It's about creating efficiencies. Mm. When I think about us having been in this global pandemic for over two years, yes. I think so much about the fact that I could order groceries mm -hmm. for my grandparents, 
right? When they weren't able to yeah. go into the grocery stores. I think about the new job opportunities, the remote learning environments mm -hmm. that have enabled access for more folks of color to get into what, what I talk about in the book, which is micro-credentialing. Mm -hmm. Being able to stack mm -hmm. a cloud certification, a data analysis certification, yes. and design your own curriculum and your own career path. Mm -hmm. And so for me, technology is more than just the idea of inventing cool things to do weird mm -hmm. things with and what have you. Yeah. It's about how do we make our lives more easy? Got it. So I know you mentioned you touched on the pandemic. Yeah. It, I still can't believe that it's been so long. And we talk about how it's impacted the world of work in general. But in your book and in general, how do you feel about how COVID-19 has impacted us? What do you see? I think early on it was really hard to, to watch. We yeah. saw the demise of jobs, mm -hmm. of businesses who had just maybe opened up a restaurant, yeah. completely have to close. We immediately saw the inequality and mm -hmm. the disparities. We saw our communities mm -hmm. not get access to adequate health care yeah. or testing. We saw students become ever more disconnected and these missing mm -hmm. students who were not able to sign on to class because they did not have devices at home yes. despite We've been trying to do work on the digital divide over the last 30 years, quite mm -hmm. frankly. But then on the other side of that, and, and not to take away from some of the tragedies that still mm -hmm. exist that we still need to pay attention yes. to, we also saw this forced innovation, this idea that you know necessity is a chief mm -hmm. response or, or innovation is a chief response to, to necessity. So we saw people reconsider how does work play a role in their lives? How can they stay home, be present parents, and mm -hmm. also earn a living? Do they need to live in the heart of one of the most expensive cities in the country? Yes. Or can they move closer to family mm -hmm. and have more buying power when it comes to purchasing a home yeah. and creating more life for themselves? 100%. So all of those themes were really present. And I think now, especially as folks of color, there were McKenzie reports that came out in 2018, and it really talked about how because black and brown folks mm -hmm. over index in service-based industries, mm -hmm. our spaces were going to be automated. We saw that rise of the essential worker. Yes. But then also this sort of surgence online of people teaching each mm -hmm. other how to get into tech, how to think about purchasing of cryptocurrency, um, how to build networks online because we were all watching D Nice on Instagram live yes. for our entertainment. Yes, indeed. <laughs> we invented verses, right? Yes. And so there's there's all of these great things that have come out of it where people are reestablishing how they want to work mm -hmm. and and how they want to show up for their communities within their communities. And so mm -hmm. it's a lot of balance here. Yeah. So much change in really a short amount of time yeah. that has just literally swept the world on how we how tech, how we interface with tech, how we interface with our lives yeah. and how our day to day experience is different. Now, I love that your book is called The Upper Hand. So can you talk about why we need yeah. the upper hand? Yeah. Even before uh, when I was thinking of and conceiving of this book mm -hmm. and trying to figure out what would be useful, I wanted mm -hmm. to create something I think similar to with, you know, your, your next move, mm -hmm. where this is something that it's not a pretty coffee table book to like put on the side and decorate. Yes. It is <laughs> like, how do you pick this up every quarter and just yes. look at the guiding exactly. principles and the resources and the references? And so when I thought about the way, again, the language had always been held in these like ivory tower spaces, yes, exactly. telling us all the ways in which technology was going to be our demise mm -hmm. versus using words for affirmation and power. Mm -hmm. yes. And when I thought about what is my goal here, it is I want people to feel like they are empowered to participate in the future of work, that they wouldn't be a mm -hmm. victim of it. Or that all of these initiatives telling you how you're not represented, you're not going to have this, mm -hmm. you're not going to ever be able to make this kind of money, that we could flip that and say, but what if someone could give you the upper hand? And so mm -hmm. that's, that's really where it came from. And that second part was for the rest of us, you know, the future of work for mm -hmm. the rest of us. Because yeah. again, so much of technology and language and this idea of who gets to be an innovator, who gets to be mm -hmm. genius, is only being discussed amongst certain groups of people. It yeah. never is folks that look like you and I yeah. or that come from communities and neighborhoods and backgrounds and environments. And so I wanted to I wanted to give people that sense of like, nope, you, you don't have to wait for somebody to come and save you. Let's go leverage all of these cool things yes. that are happening and save ourselves. 
I absolutely love that. I think even how I talk about the podcast and the intro and the outro, I'm always like, you have the power to change the trajectory of your career. Absolutely. And we need more books like yours, Mm -hmm. like mine, to teach us how to navigate the the world of work with ease, especially in tech, where things are changing so, so, so fast. Like I spent almost 10 years in higher ed, and it's one of those industries where you feel like nothing's going to change. Right. Ever. A lot of nonprofit, higher education, it's like it takes forever for change to happen. When we look at tech, things happen so, so, so fast. So and quickly. I remember looking at some studies, they were talking about how during the recession, during times like this, especially in tech, it grows even faster to solve our problems. Mm-hmm. And I don't think people think about tech in that way. It's it's really to help us level up. It's to help us go to the next level, to help us do the next thing. And out of hard times, some really beautiful things can come through. Absolutely. And we've, we've seen that as evidence all across the board. And I think we also have to be very clear that we're bringing meaning mm-hmm. to tech in a different kind of way. Mm-hmm. Because black culture, brown culture creates everything around us all the time. Yes. So imagine if we can apply that to new software developers mm-hmm. who are creating the next whatever or are on teams that are focused on urban planning and smart cities where mm-hmm. you can actually have people who are from different walks of life contributing to the building and the output of yes. some of these tools. Like we still have to remember that, yes, get your money, yep. make sure you're negotiating well, make sure that you are creating a space for your career to thrive, and also understand that it is imperative that we have more of our next generation, existing generation, mm-hmm. career transitioners, also hyper-focused on you are bringing your full self into this work. Yes. And the technology and the innovation benefits from that so much because we, we remove the homogeny and we add in dimensionality. Mm-hmm. So knowing where you are now, you're doing so much incredible work. Thank you. What do you wish you knew 10 years ago? Oh my gosh, 10 (laughs) years ago, Lordy. Because I think about like (laughs) having graduated in in a recession. Yeah. You know, and it was like. It was tough. Who knew, (laughs) right? Because Mm -hmm. you were sort of forced again to like reinvent and invent Mm -hmm. yourself. And I built my career and I talk about this in the book. I remember getting my first job out of college, not because I had my degree per se, but because I had a popular blog. I had a virtual and digital presence that served as my resume. Yes. And the designer that hired me to work on the marketing e-commerce team, like that was the first thing that she said when I hopped on the phone for an interview. Wow. And she was like, I read your blog and I am recreating this new wellness line Mm -hmm. because I was writing about organic um, beauty products Okay. for black women and I was also infusing that with environmental justice wow. and I mean it was the era of the blog and I was like yes, I'm in was. school and you know I want product and all that kind of stuff yeah. and that was essentially my my digital resume to show how I could execute how yeah. I could communicate and so when I think about what I would have wanted maybe 10 years ago mm-hmm. maybe a little bit more confidence to have yes. negotiated like better salaries for if myself. If you're reading my blog, then <laughs> the salary. Right, like exactly. You know, that part, I don't mm-hmm. know that I had um, the kind of coaching mm-hmm. that would have been helpful at the time. Yeah. Um, I also think too that, you know, college almost became a, a, a breeding ground for a mill of just getting your degree, right? Yes. And I tried yes. to infuse myself in conferences and things like that, but... When I think about the the power of the early days of the podcast, like mm-hmm. building a true sense of a content stack, and I talk about this in the book as yeah. well, like the tools that you need to really understand what's happening and how to package yourself, how to sell yes. yourself. I wish I would have had that a bit earlier. You know, I didn't really update my LinkedIn profile until maybe three years ago. Okay. You know, and get it professionally designed and yeah. taking all the tips. I didn't understand the power and the utility of some of these spaces. Mm. And so I wish maybe 10 years ago I could have really capitalized um, on those opportunities. Yeah, that's such a great point. I think that when we were talking about, when I talk about career development, it was this one size fits all mentality of mm-hmm. this is how you do your resume, this is how you do your cover letter, right. this is what LinkedIn looks like. If you're going to have a blog, this is what you should do. Mm-hmm. And I think there wasn't a lot of room for individuality, mm. like to really show your personality. So when you had it, like I'm sure on your blog, that's what probably helped you stand out because that was your creative outlet that you were kind of doing it your way. 
yeah. that that definitely help with your portfolio. But now, yeah. especially with tech, with the even the cultural norms in the mm-hmm. industry, it's really allowing you to show up as your authentic self to, and that's needed. Yeah, it's so 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 needed. So I want to pivot a bit. I want you to tell us about TP Insights. Yes, yes, yes. So, so the plug or TP Insights. Um, you know, I, I kind of built that accidentally. I had been doing some freelancing mm-hmm. and just wanting to cover more Black innovation. Okay. You know, I'm from Seattle originally. My grandfather was a you know was a big techie. Um, I got an opportunity, especially being in such close proximity to the Microsofts of the world, the Amazons, yes. Expedias, um, you know, all of those folks to be part of a program called the Technology Access Foundation that allowed me to learn how to code in high school and then get internships at Microsoft. And I was, I was back home not too long ago and speaking to some of my old instructors and just reflecting on, I had been built by engineers and scientists and um, technologists mm-hmm. who were black, who were brown, who were gay, who were all spectrums of Mm -hmm. of society and rainbow. And so when I got into the tech industry in my professional life post-college, I was always so confused by this idea of all of these disparity studies. It was, you know, all of these big tech companies were releasing the diversity reports Mm -hmm. and all of the language was so hyper-focused on who's missing. And I didn't see a ton of journalism Mm -hmm. that was reflecting, that was reflective of who was actually there. And I'm like, well, I, I got the Blacks at Microsoft scholarship. My mentors, you know, my, my coaches, my trainers, mm-hmm. these were people who looked like me, came from communities that I came from. So I know that they exist. Yes. But we have, especially in journalism, has been intellectually lazy about mm-hmm. shaping and building out that narrative of what is a Black technologist? What is a brown yeah. technologist? What does a female technologist look like? Yeah. That's not in a tokenization kind of way. So... Fast forward, I'm like covering the ground of like South by Southwest, you know, placing pieces in the root, placing pieces in Black Enterprise, like when none of these publications were going down to South by Southwest. And I was like, the language barrier. Yes. The language barrier of innovation, you know, we have to we have to bridge that gap. Mm -hmm. And I decided, you know, what would it be like if I could create a Black Bloomberg? What Mm -hmm. if I could take the data sets and and start mapping trends and covering this, this surgence of technologists who are for the first time getting access to capital in the millions of yes. dollars, you know? And, and so that's really how the plug was born. It kind of morphed. And at some point I just say, all right, it's going to be do or die. I'm either going to create this thing or I'm going to like make it another blog and <laughs> yes. keep going to work, you yes. know? And, and, and quite honestly, again, going from accident into deciding to go to grad school to study data and journalism, mm-hmm. getting frustrated because I wasn't finding the data sets that I needed and having to build them from scratch and then realizing oh, data is oil these days. Like, yes. I can pull this together exactly. on how black technologists are, are building, growing, and shaping literally the future of society yep. across the world. Like, this is going to be the new standard. Intelligence for an inclusive future. Mm-hmm. I mean, we have MBA students that sign up to read our case studies and to download our reports. Mm-hmm. And so... In a nutshell, I mean, you know, we we really are trying to drive this idea of business intelligence covering the black innovation economy. I love it. I absolutely love it. So I feel like I want to ask you at least one more question. Yeah, of course. To anyone who's interested in launching a company in tech, yeah. getting funding, I know, is such a big thing. And you've been excited extremely successful in it. Um, and I know we generally don't talk about this on the podcast, but I feel like I have to ask because you're here and you've been so great yeah. at it. Yeah. What insights, tips do you have? Oh my gosh, there's so many different ways. I think that we get like these really fun announcements or such and such as raise millions of dollars yes. and all that. And I think that, you know, that's kind of one aspect of it. You really have to decide for the kind of business you're creating. Is this an investable business? Mm-hmm. I didn't set out to really raise capital in a traditional sense. Um, so grants I knew that existed, um, I would apply for. Yeah. And we were able, we're, I think by the time we close out our second quarter, we'll have raised over a million dollars in grants, which wow. means that we get to keep more of the equity in the business. Exactly. And we get to hyper focus on, you know, doing our work and not necessarily, you know, having to answer to a ton of investors. Now that can always change for sure. Mm-hmm. 
What's been helpful for me, and everyone's journey is very different, is you know being part of networks and accelerators and incubators that mm-hmm. can really help hold your hand. I don't come from a family of entrepreneurs. Okay. I come from some regular Midwest Western folks who go to work. <laughs> they work there for 20, 30 years yes, and, and they retire. retire. You get the watch, the whole nine. Yes. <laughs> so exactly. So being in environments that are entrepreneurial to really start to develop that 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 muscle memory and that brain power of of how to think as an entrepreneur is helpful. And a lot of times some accelerators may come with cash, like yes. the tech stars, the YCs of the world. Um, you also have some programs that will just give you a grant that you can use for your seed money to start building out your company. You have to decide what works for you. Got it. Collab Capital in Atlanta is a revenue-based financing um, initiative. They've invested in companies like Hairbrella. Mm -hmm. And so there's so many different options right now to kind of look at raising capital. And I would say, again, you know, taking that upper hand approach because we, we all do know the statistics. Yes, we know that black 100%. women receive the least amount of funding. We do know that that black and brown um, you know, entrepreneurs that are looking for venture capital mm-hmm. are a less than 10% of total venture capital dollars that have yes. been invested year over year. But I would say take the upper hand and mm-hmm. look at the options and possibilities, both in your immediate environment Mm -hmm. the networks that present themselves where you can participate virtually and digitally, um, and as well as things like crowdfunding. Um, Don Dixon Apagane of Popcom has been very successful in Mm -hmm. raising money through crowdfunding. And her philosophy has been, I want my community to be able to invest in me, whether they are accredited investors or not. An accredited investor has liquid um, assets at least of $200,000 or more. Mm -hmm. And how many people I know in my my immediate community don't have that. So that yeah. means they can't invest in companies or grow well. Exactly. And so, um, and I believe Angela Benton from Streamlytics as well has raised money through crowdfunding. So there's so many more options than there were even a decade ago that you don't have to go into places that you feel like are, are going to be relatively oppressive these days. So more options on the table. You just have to do what works for you. I love that. And I... I honestly never even thought of crowdfunding when I think about raising capital. No. Crowdfunding did not even come to my mm-hmm. mind. I know for Manifest Yourself this past year, we definitely looked into grants. Yeah. Um, and we've been successful in getting some, but nice. not at like the scale. Yeah. Um, and it just, there's so many different options. And I didn't even think of crowdfunding for myself. Yeah. yeah. So with that today, I don't want to let you go, but I'm going to have to. <laughs> um, but let the people know, like, where can we find you? Yes. Where's your book? We need to know all, all the, the things. things. All yes. the things. Well, definitely sign up for the weekly briefing at tpinsights.com. You get a free briefing every single Monday covering the black innovation economy. I'm just Sherelle underscore Dorsey across all of social media. And you've got to pick up Upper Hand, The Future of Work for the Rest of Us. Wherever books are sold, hit up Barnes & Noble, hit up Amazon, but definitely shop a local black-owned bookstore as well. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for the invitation. This was great. Thank you. Have a great day, y'all. Think about it this way. If someone is spending their free time learning more about how to do their job on their own accord, they are probably someone who's highly motivated and is a high achiever who would probably be really great for you to speak to.